you gonna do? Yeah, Kobe's right. You were on the radio station for 35 minutes. Yeah. I'm sure he yeah. did. I mean, I gave him his little 30 minutes of fame again, man. He's playing in China right now, right? He's going over there in a couple months. Too. Maybe you'll get back to the NBA one day. I can see what it's like up close. All right, welcome back to the channel, everyone. Hope you all are having a good day so far. Uh, strap in for a little bit of a long one. Grab a drink, grab some popcorn, do the thing you got to do, or some snacks. I don't know why we always say popcorn. Uh, this one is called, He Ruthlessly Refused to Speak to His Teammate. And um, this is by Mike Korzamba. And uh, it's about Kobe. And that's about all I know for now. So... Um, my guess is uh, Smush Parker because I know they had a lot of beef even post playing with each other but I know like Kobe just like savagely despised this dude I never really understood why or <laughs> what was going on in that dynamic between the two of them but man these two just did not like you, you think like he had beef with Dwight Howard and from what I understand it was nothing compared to this so I'm gonna guess it's either it's either Dwight Howard or Smush, but we'll find out real soon. Anyways, this is a video by uh, Mike Korzamba I'm going to react to, and I'm going to link the original video down below if you want to check out uh, Mike's channel or if you want to watch this video without my commentary. Um, about 30 minutes, 31 minutes long, so if you're ready, and, uh, and if you hit that like button for me already, then I really appreciate that. Then let's do this. <laughs> Did you know for an entire two years, Kobe Bryant did not say a single word to his starting point guard? That after oh, Smush, Smush Parker asked yeah. Kobe an innocent question about football, Kobe responded with... He told me one day in practice, I tried to talk to him outside of, you know, basketball about football. He looked at me in practice and was dead serious and said, you can't talk to me. You need more accolades under your belt before you come talk to me. After saying Good this, God. Kobe never spoke to Smush off the court again. <laughs> and this beef ran even deeper. When asked about Smush after his time with the Lakers. Kobe responded with... He's playing in China right now, right? Maybe you'll get back to the NBA one day. I'll see what it's like up close. The question is... Why? Why? Why did Kobe Bryant despise Smush Parker to the level where he did not say a single word to him for two years? Yeah, what and is it? after those two years, what changed in Kobe's mindset that turned him from a leader who did not talk to his own starting point guard to a veteran star who won two more titles? What's up, Mike here? And Kobe Bryant's problems with his teammates and the media did not begin in 2005. Before 2005, we had the very open Shaq vs. Kobe beef, yeah. as well as the Colorado court case. With both of these situations, Kobe went from a media darling to one of the most hated on and criticized players in the league as he spent the 2004 season flying back and forth between court cases and NBA basketball games. Yeah, so let's, oh man, he's, he's torching my sons like he always is. Uh, Boris Diaw, good luck. Um, the, uh, what the hell is I about to say? Um, yeah, the timeline, the timeline. So this is uh, right after Shaq left, that whole thing blew up. And this is the very beginning of uh, of Kobe doing it on his own. And it started out really rough. You know, Kobe had to put up a ridiculous amount of points just to, like, creep into the playoffs. But so that's the dynamic here. This is Kobe as the leader now for the first time. Despite these on-court controversies, though, the 2004 Lakers started with a 21-3 record and were called by many as a candidate for the best team ever. On this team, Kobe and Shaq were joined by Hall of Famers Carl Malone and Gary Payton, two veterans who were looking for their first rings late in their careers. The problem was, despite this hot start, by the 2004 season... By the way, that gets a little misunderstood. Sorry for pausing. But this was the end of Carl Malone's career. And this was past Gary Payton's prime. But Gary Payton came into the league much later than Carl Malone. So Gary Payton stuck around all the way till even, heck, he was part of that, uh, that Miami Heat team with Dwayne Wade and Shaq to win a championship. So he stuck around for a little bit longer late in their careers. The problem was, despite this hot start, by the 2004 season, the Kobe and Shaq saga had truly gotten to an unthinkable level. In yeah. an interview with Jim Gray before the 2004 season began, Kobe called Shaq fat and out of shape, and Shaq <laughs> did not take this well. Still though, this what was line? old news. Kobe and Shaq had been arguing like brothers since they had began playing with each other. They had even called each other out publicly like this before. So what was different in 2004? Women. In Kobe's <laughs> 
infamous <laughs> Colorado court case. He made headlines when he told police he should have done what Shaq does, pay the women to say nothing, and that Shaq had already spent $1 million of hush money in situations <laughs> like this. And, and we, we've covered all of this um, in a, a secret base video. So I'm not going to get into detail here, but yeah, dude, those two just needed to stop talking to the media because they just kept bashing each other to the media. And apparently they weren't really doing it face to face. They were just doing it through the media, which was a really bad move, especially in California, man. Jack was married with children when this news broke, and he felt that Kobe had gone way too far and broken a code, which meant at a summer workout, <laughs> Shaq tried to attack Kobe. Kobe stated that he told the police this <laughs> off the record, and then they sold him out to the tabloid, so it wasn't his fault. Regardless of what you believe, we had a literal soap opera, and through it all, the Lakers did end up choosing Kobe above everyone, because after Los Angeles was dominated- By the way, lesson, nothing you say to the police in a situation like that is off the record they're not your i mean I'm, I'm not this is not like uh police hate or anything in a situation like that where you're at the precinct or whatever and you're talking to them yeah they're in control so whatever you say is going to be used in your favor or against you so you just want to say what you need to say and nothing more kobe was acting like it sounds like he was acting like they were his buddies in that scenario which in that in that situation they were not his buddies they were there to, to, to try and figure out what's going on and whether Kobe was guilty of uh, you know what um, at that time. And if you don't, just look it up, what, what happened during that time and why he was in court. Um, but yeah, they're not your buddies at that point. They're investigating a crime or a potential crime. So him saying, yeah, well, I should have just done what Shaq did, you know, just paid off the women and, you know, be done with it. Like that was a bad move, dude. That's on the record. But Kobe was young. You know, so I'll, I'll, I'll give him some leeway. But, dude, don't do that. In a five-game NBA Finals loss to the Pistons, the Lakers did break it up. And just because he was clearly the most likely candidate to make a trade demand, the media blamed Kobe when Shaq was traded to the Miami Heat. However, it would later turn out that both of them had demanded trades. Yeah. And to be fair to Kobe, Shaq not only demanded a trade after it was said that Phil Jackson was not returning, but also he had demanded a trade in the 2001 season after a win because he did not shoot enough. So Shaq was not exactly the most stable superstar in the league. But guys, before we continue, I am very <laughs> excited to thank our friend. All right, DraftKings promo. Yeah, man. Uh, back then, uh, we blamed uh, we blamed Kobe for, for Shaq leaving, hands down. Not going to even sugarcoat it. That's 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 what we believed. We didn't have all the, all the information back then, though. We do now. The problem was the return Los Angeles got back for Shaq was just not enough to keep them in contention. While the Miami Heat would grow to an eventual NBA champion with the addition of Shaquille O'Neal, yeah, the years. Lakers received back just Karan Butler, Brian Grant, Lamar Odom, and a 2006 first round pick, a package that would see them completely bottom out before an unlikely slash amazing trade would eventually save them. That is where our story truly begins. The 2005 season, one year before or Smush Parker officially joins the team. The okay. 2005 Lakers are remembered for their tremendous failures. What gets forgotten is their hot start and playoff aspirations. Under the leadership of head coach Rudy Tomjanovich and with the motivation to show the world that they did not need Shaq, Los Angeles jumped out to a 24 and 19 start behind 27.5 points, 6.6 .6 assists, and 6.3 rebounds per game from Kobe. 25 year old Lamar Odom emerged as a reliable option at the power forward position with a double double. 15 one points and 10 rebounds per game and this for sure yeah uh lamar odom uh before this was playing for the miami heat and he was a good number two guy for Dwayne wade for sure uh very underappreciated player Ve he played the pippen role uh for the lakers he played he, he played the pippen role very well 2005 team was also highlighted by a young Karan Butler before he mm -hmm. became an all-star with the Washington Wizards and Chucky Atkinson, who manned the point guard spot for one season before LA brought in Smush Park. Yeah, Despite the success, the off-court drama was still there, though, as the fallout from Kobe's court case continued to follow him and to make things worse. Phil Jackson, Kobe's former coach, wrote a book mm -hmm. in which he called Kobe next to uncoachable, yeah. stating Shaq was a player who would pout at criticism but make the changes 
needed, while Kobe would smile at any remark, say he understood, and then do whatever Kobe wanted. <laughs> it was official. The media had turned yep. on Kobe, and while Los Angeles began this season respectfully, Shaq, Dwayne Wade, and the Miami Heat began their season with a statement. By Christmas Day, Miami was seen as a top championship contender at 21-7, and, and Shaq had people wondering if LA had made a mistake. On this Christmas Day, Kobe and Shaq would play each other for the first uh -huh. time as rivals, and the NBA knew what they were doing. This oh, man. I, yeah, I did a reaction to that game, too. It is... That was so awesome live with my family, just watching that on Christmas. Wow. The, the most tension I've ever experienced in a basketball game ever. And by live, I mean we were at home watching on TV, but never felt any kind of tension like that in a basketball game if before or since. People Center matchup drew the highest views in a regular season game since 1998, and the players would wow. put on a show. Jumping wow. Most viewed game since... 19 since the NBA finals Jordan uh Jordan and the Bulls versus Karl Malone and Stockton and the um and the uh <laughs> sorry that the Utah Jazz game six that's awesome yeah yeah we all talked about that game or season game since 1998 and the players would put on a show mm -hmm. jumping into this one with just over three minutes left the score is tied when kobe rises up and draws a foul he would knock down both free throws but on the other end there was shaq with a dunk Boom. to tie things up <laughs> then with time winding down by the way when shaq dunks things explode but on the Look other end, there was Shaq with boom. a boom. <laughs> this guy he just went up straight. He just went up straight and then dunk boom. to tie things up. <laughs> then with time winding down, Dwayne Wade would isolate with a chance to win it. They waited too long. They waited long. They Wade. The shot. Wade the shot. Up two with time running down in this game, Miami failed to get a shot up, which meant Los Angeles and Kobe had the ball with an opportunity to win. The inbound, Bryant gets double. Kobe Bryant. Oh, amazing that it didn't go in. With this miss, Kobe would finish with 42 points, but didn't score a single point in overtime. An omen for what the 2005 Lakers would become as a whole. Yeah. A team that had a hot start, but an ice cold finish. As while they did start at 24 and 19 with Rudy Tomjanovic, when Tom Janovic resigned due to health problems and overall exhaustion, suddenly the Lakers plummeted. In their what was it again? I remember he got sick. He resigned. Uh, mental and physical exhaustion unrelating, unrelated to his past um, battle with bladder cancer. Man, can we just say it? He probably just, he, he didn't want to do it. He didn't want to do it. As much love as I have for Kobe, because I see the whole story, I got to experience the whole journey of Kobe. I and I, I love Kobe, but I got to be real. And uh, during this time, he was still a brat. You know, he was uncoachable during this time. Phil Jackson wasn't wrong, and nobody wanted to do it. The only person who would do it was Phil eventually, because they made amends, and Kobe changed his ways as he matured. So, yeah, when I say these things, it's just I'm just referring to young Kobe. Young Kobe was he was a nightmare. He was a terror, totally skilled and talented. But as far as a teammate, he was not a good teammate, man. <laughs> you know, he was no one's friend. He didn't get along with anybody and he didn't listen to his coach. But, yeah, later on, you fast forward about two, about three years, two to three years after this, you know, enough of him losing. He learned his lesson and he really matured and him and Phil had a great relationship all the way to the end. Resigned due to health problems and overall exhaustion, suddenly the Lakers plummeted. In their last 29 games, they went just 10 and 19, giving them an overall record of 34 and 38, which meant for the first time since 1994, the Lakers would watch the playoffs from home. And uh -huh. to make matters even worse, Kobe watched as Shaq almost brought the Miami Heat all the way to the NBA Finals before Miami fell to the Detroit Pistons in the Eastern Conference Finals in seven games. The headlines that offseason were vicious. Kobe was selfish. 
coach. He should have never forced Shaq out of yeah. LA. The Lakers should have picked Shaq over uh -huh. Kobe. A lot was said that summer, but the focus of our story is on Kobe's leadership and his relationship with his team. All right, let's in get this push. Kobe's let's growth in that push. area of life would largely benefit from a massive off-season move. The Lakers were bringing back Phil Jackson, even with his new book. It was official, Phil Jackson was back. He was going to save LA, and during that summer, Los Angeles also made a small move that would grow into a headline maker. As a largely unknown Smush Parker signed with LA on a two-year deal that paid him less than $1 million a season after Parker had an impressive training camp. Smush Parker wouldn't mind. He had fought on two different teams to secure a role, and after practice after practice of impressive play, 24-year-old Smush Parker was picked by Phil Jackson as the Lakers surprise starter of the year. From unknown free agent to starting point guard of the Los Angeles Lakers, this should have been a celebrated underdog story, only it was here where Smush's problems with Kobe would begin. Okay. Smush claims that after a few games of starting, he figured it would be okay to get some friendly banter going with Kobe, and so he asked Kobe about football. To this, Kobe would respond, What would you say your thoughts are now on Kobe Bryant? Yeah, we didn't have much of a relationship or a friendship, but who did at that time? He right. told me one day in practice, I tried to talk to him outside of, you know, basketball, about football. He looked at me in practice and was dead serious and said, you can't talk to me. You need more accolades under your belt before you come talk to me. From here on out, during their time with the Lakers, Smush says that Kobe never spoke to him again off the court. It's which is an absolutely insane thing to do to your teammate, especially when you are supposed to be the leader yeah. of the team. So yeah, why? Uh, yeah, there's, there's the, the toughness of Michael Jordan, but Jordan joked around and played with his team. You know what I mean? But he was dead serious and, and super competitive and very demanding. But you can't you can't ask that of your team unless you're going to soften up a little bit around them. You know what I mean? You have to pick and choose your points. But young Kobe, man, young Kobe just didn't give a damn. He was all business 100 percent of the time. And he didn't know how to be a leader yet. Not yet. I say that very crucially because if you go to the second half of his career, all his ex-teammates praise him. They love his leadership. They love playing with him. You know, they have fond memories with him. But during this era, everyone hated him. <laughs> Why did this happen? Gilbert Arenas has a solid theory. He probably randomly called Smush five in the morning and said, hey, yo, I'm training. Where are you at? And Smush didn't come. You don't drop whatever you're doing for this? Yeah. I don't respect you anymore. When he had like this thing against you, when he challenged you, when he put out a challenge, you didn't accept it. From there, he don't respect you. Yeah, that's just a guess though. I mean, that's just a guess. And Gil kind of gets these theories in his head and then he makes them reality and then preaches them as though it was fact. But who knows, he could be right. Clock strikes uh, 12 twice a day. You gonna do? It. Yeah, Kobe's right. He was on the radio station for 35 minutes. Yeah. I'm sure he yeah, did. I mean, I gave him his little 30 minutes of fame again. Man. He's playing in China right now, right? He's going over there in a couple months. Too. Maybe he'll get back to the game one day. See what it's like up close. Man. <laughs> as not only did Kobe not talk to Smush again, but he also, as we saw, went as far as to make fun of Smush by asking if he was now playing in China. On Kobe's side, he still had a lot of growing up to do as a leader. Was this some sort of Jedi mind trick to try and push Smush? Probably. But different players respond in different ways, and Smush would say the following. When you heard him say that, how'd you feel? Uh, uh I felt small, felt a little disrespected. Having your starting point guard feel small and disrespected next to you is not going to get you anywhere. And why did Kobe not respect Parker's journey to the NBA? After playing in Greece just years before, in the 2006 season at the age of 24, Smush would start all 82 games for the Lakers and averaged 11.5 points and 3.7 assists per game on 44% shooting. Not great numbers, but not all-time terrible. In comparison, Derek Fisher is known as a Lakers legend, and in 2003, Fisher started all 82 games. In those 82 games, he averaged 10.5 points, 3.6 assists per game on 40. The numbers are almost identical. The numbers are almost identical, but Derek Fisher did bring a level of leadership that obviously Smush wouldn't be able to do. I was thinking before Mike brought this up that, what is it? Is it just that he wanted his point card back? He just wanted D-Fish back? Because they were really tight, really close, and eventually he did get D-Fish back. So I wonder if that's all it is. It was just hate for the new guy.
3.7% shooting. It's likely that when we look at these numbers, Kobe's disdain for Smush Parker had nothing to do with Smush Parker at all. It is instead very probable that Kobe was very mad that Shaq was winning at the highest level. And so Kobe, who was in no mood for underdog stories, took his anger out on the people around him. It's been said during the 2006 season that Kobe was not a fun teammate to be around at all. Yeah. He was mad at every yeah. The front office in particular had messed up. They believed Kwame Brown, once a number one pick, still had potential. And so they traded away Chucky Atkinson and Karan Butler in order to get him. The problem was that in just two seasons, Karan Butler would become an all-star. I know, I was gonna say, I can't believe they got rid of Karan. That's, that was crazy. That was one of the few good pieces they had, him and like Odom. Kwame Brown in two seasons would continue to be terrible. So on a team he disliked with a front office he did not believe in, Kobe decided he was going to go out shooting. For the year in 2006, Kobe put up a career high 27.2 shots a game. And with this amount of shots, we had Hold up. some high 27. Oh man, he still shot 45%. Okay. 7.2 shots a game and with this amount of shots we had some historic performances on yeah, december 20th 2005 through a combination of jumpers and drives to the basket kobe would finish the first quarter against the mavericks with 15 points on seven of eight shooting maverick star dirk nowitzki could only watch in awe as kobe continued to attack and in the third quarter alone kobe would score 30 points to give him 62 points through three periods <laughs> more than the mavericks entire team this was the first time one player had outscored a team through three quarters in the shot clock era and man, to, to score 30 points in a quarter 30 points in 12 minutes the hell man you know what does that multiply into 12 24 36 so not quite three points but like 2.5 points per minute per minute and the shot clock is 24 seconds how do you do that <laughs> This was no bum team. This was a Dallas Mavericks team that would lose in the 2006 NBA Finals. To make this an all-time legendary night in a move of pure sportsmanship, Kobe decided to sit out the fourth quarter as the game was out of hand. The fans hated this. If Kobe had kept going, he could have scored 80, 90, maybe even 100. Fans wanted to see what Kobe was capable of, and almost exactly one month later, we saw it, where we would see Kobe Bryant's best regular season game against the 2006 Toronto Raptors, mm -hmm. a team who won just 27 games and were playing older veterans such as Jalen Rose. In the of... first half against the Raptors on January 22nd, 2006, Kobe had 26 points and it looked like he was on pace for another 50 point night, which was nothing new. Only nobody could expect what would happen next. In the second half, Kobe caught fire and he would end up making 18 of 28 shots in the second half alone. James has 22 on the night. Knocked away by Kobe. Great hustle by Kobe. Damn. He's going to score. And dunk Lakers lead. Five. For three again. Yes. <laughs> well, they're 70. <laughs> Kobe guarded by Mo Peterson. Kobe pumped. Yeah, the difference oh, is they needed him. Lakers. They needed him in the fourth this quarter this game against Dallas. It was a blowout. 81 point so the good sportsman game. thing Ladies to do was to sit out during a blowout. But here, he needed history. every single point. Yeah, I'll have a, uh, a, a vodka martini. How many olives would you like? 81. <laughs> this second half included six three-pointers, and by the time this night it. was over, Kobe Bryant had scored 81 points, still the second most in NBA history behind Wilt Chamberlain's 100. We need to remember at oh, this uh, point... That, that, that shooting percentage. 61%. He had two assists. <laughs> they both had two assists. That's hilarious. Dude, 25 rebounds, Wilt Chamberlain. You freaking monster most in NBA history behind Wilt Chamberlain's 100. We need to remember at this point in time, Kobe Bryant had still not won a single MVP award. And as a basketball player now, individually, Kobe's game was seemingly better than it had ever been before. But when the 2006 MVP was announced, Kobe wasn't even in the run. 35.4 points, 5.3 rebounds, and 4.5 assists per game on 45% shooting was not even enough to crack the top three as the voting went Steve Nash, LeBron, Dirk, then Kobe. Yeah, Many it's, I know, I, I take a lot of heat for this. It's because 
the Lakers weren't that good yet. So it, it, it does factor in how good your team is and what your record is. And that plays part of the narrative. And everybody listed above him. Yeah. Nash came in and turned around the Suns into, I mean, we were, we were, we were a contender, a real contender. LeBron was finally figuring it out in Cleveland. They were ready to, to start contending. Dirk, he's ready to, he was about to win a championship, you know, or actually he's ready to go contend for a championship, I should say. And he's, yeah, he was, he was pretty much at his prime. So Kobe, it was not because of what he did individually. Kobe's individual, if you take winning out of it, Kobe would win hands down. He was the best player in the league, no doubt about it. But it was the winning that that stopped him. Three, as the voting went Steve Nash, LeBron, Dirk, then Kobe. Many have argued after this season that Kobe's scoring greatness should have earned him the MVP award. However, the NBA was in a period of time where wins were weighed heavily in the voting, and so Kobe yeah, there it is. on a 45-win Lakers team was outshadowed by Nash's 18.8 points and 10.5 assists on a 54-win championship contender in the Phoenix Suns. Can I just this point out Steve one Nash thing? The MVP. Look at look at look at look at the percentages for Nash. So yeah, yeah, he got 19, but he got he got 10 assists a game, couple of rebounds, whatever. He shot 44% from the three-point line and 51% from the field as a little guy. Can you imagine him in today's era? Dude, dude would be shoot. He would destroy the league right now with this kind of shooting on a 54-win championship contender in the Phoenix Suns. This meant Steve Nash won the MVP for the second straight season, but if we dive deeper into this season, we find just how remarkable Kobe's season truly was from a scoring standpoint. In the 2006 season, teams shot just 79 shots a game compared to the 88.9 shots a game they averaged in 2024, which means if we were to adjust Kobe's points in 2006 to 2024's pace of play, we'd see Kobe average 39.9 eight points per game but it was nash who won his second mvp while kobe stayed a zero time winner at this point in time and while this vote was not official in the first round of the playoffs the speculation was there that nash was going to take home the mvp over bryant which set the stage for an incredible first round playoff show oh, no. in round can one i react to one kobe video that doesn't highlight him torching my sons <laughs> just once <laughs> And I know the outcome is good, but uh, still. Of the 2006 playoffs, we had the Lakers taking the court against the number two seed Phoenix Suns. In this series, we also had a mystery in game seven that if it's true, does not exactly shed the best light on Kobe Bryant. We're going to get there. As for game one in this series, the Lakers began the fourth quarter tied and in this fourth, Kobe would give us 10 points, but in the process, he shot just three for 11. Meanwhile, Phoenix caught fire for from deep as Tim Thomas hit back-to-back -back threes. Then came spark plug Leandro Barbosa, and finally Steve Nash capped off a shooting display that locked down game one for Phoenix. It was obvious here though, Kobe in LA could hang with Phoenix. Yeah. This was not going to be an easy series for the Suns, and our man Smush Parker even had a promising 15 points in game one. Kobe though- Of course he did, because Nash was a terrible defender. So every, every point guard would go off against Nash. And yeah, this should have been an annihilation. Sun should have destroyed these guys in the first round. Just nope. Kobe, Kobe was, he was just that damn good. Rudolph continued to not talk to really any of his teammates at all. He was in an isolated zone where he thought he would operate best. And also he really did think this way of playing was best for the team. He wasn't doing it to win awards or to make more money or anything bad. Obviously though, the rest of his teammates did not respond well to mm -hmm. this. The thing is though, yeah, they're when uncomfortable when your leader is quiet. And 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 that just ice cold to everybody. No one's comfortable. No one's in their natural element and their natural flow anymore. He set the tone. Win basketball games, people put up with this kind of persona. And in game two in Phoenix, a balanced attack, including nine first half points from Kwame Brown and six second quarter points from Smush Parker, led to a surprising 15 point Lakers first half lead. Then in the second half, Kobe closed the door with 19 second half points, which included a statement dunk over MVP Steve Nash. Oh no. Look at the hustle of Lamar Odom. Get out Off of there, Nash. Kobe Bryant. 
Counted for two. Let's see. Yep. Counted yeah. for two and a he foul. Got Suddenly, we had ourselves a series, Oof. and the media <laughs> jumped back onto Kobe's side, especially after in game three. Even his role players were stepping up for him. Three separate Lakers starters, Luke Walden, Lamar Odom, and Kwame Brown, finished with double doubles in points and rebounds in game three, and none other than Smush Parker led the Lakers in scoring with 18 points. Suddenly, in the 2006 playoffs, the Los Angeles Lakers were playing on a new level and Phoenix needed to stop their momentum quickly before things got out of hand. In game four with 12.6 seconds left, it looked like they had done so, as after Boris Diaw knocked down a free throw to give the Suns a five point lead. Phoenix thought they were tying the series up, only Smush Parker would not let the Lakers die. Smush Parker puts up the three. Over Nash. Oh, wow. And then came Kobe Bryant. They'd love to get it into Nash's hands, and they do. They do. Well, knocked away, stolen by Parker. Oh, there it is. Here comes George to Kobe Bryant. Bryant inside. It's good. Damn. It's good. That was Smush again, oh, wasn't it? That was Smush. That was Smush on the defense. A three by Smush Parker, a steal by yeah. Smush Parker, a layup by Kobe. It is a tie game, and somehow Kobe still won't ever speak a word to Smush. He was there for the battle. As down three late well, again. he's speaking words to him right there, right? I mean, he's hugging him and saying something. Won't ever speak a Look word at him. to Look he's, he's talking right into his ear. So, what? What? Smush, he was there for the battle. As down three late again, the Los Angeles Lakers would just not give up. Lakers are out of timeouts. Oh, he's, he's going, he's going, going for the two all. inside. A one point game. Walker can tip it. What a Bryant series. Oh, oh no. Final seconds. Oh no. Bryant for the win. Bang! The 2006 uh. Lakers were at their peak, suddenly against what was seen as a juggernaut in the Phoenix Suns. Los Angeles was up 3-1 to one and Kobe <laughs> Bryant had led them to greatness. That is what people focused on. Smush Parker had his own great moments. They went completely unnoticed. Smush Parker's failures would not go unnoticed. As after these incredible wins, we had a tremendous drop-off. The Lakers would lose both games 5 and 6 and the media yet again flip-flopped on Kobe. <laughs> Kobe Bryant was the problem again he was a ball hog you can never win with a ball yep. hog that is all anyone heard and for the first time in a long time kobe let the media get under his skin yeah, well, and did something that i would say is pretty unforgivable whoa, if you whoa. are his teammate as how'd that happen <laughs> how did my speed pick up um i was just about to, to to pause it and say yeah this is when we all knew there was no more argument that kobe was not uh, uh, he wasn't he wasn't MJ, okay? I'm just going to put it straight. Back then, what he's about to do in this game seven, we were like, MJ would never have done this. No way would he have done this. This is a very selfish thing that Kobe did. And uh, yeah, let's let it play out skin and did something that I will say is pretty unforgivable if you are his teammate. As after players like Smush Parker shot 1 for 7 in game 5 and 0 for 5 in game 6, Kobe Bryant wanted to make a point to the media, a selfish point. He was going to show everyone what happened when Kobe didn't shoot the ball. Did something happen in the locker room of game 7 of this game? That is unknown, it has never been reported. What is known is that in the first half of game 7, the Phoenix Suns built a lead off of the great play of Steve Nash, Boris Diaw, and Sean Marion. The Lakers would head to the locker room trailing by 15, which meant a comeback was still possible, and at this point in time, Kobe Bryant was playing completely normally. In fact, he was having a great game with 23 points on 8 of 13 shooting, but in the third quarter, Kobe refused to yeah. shoot. Same yeah. story in the fourth, in the second half of the 2006 playoffs. In game seven, Kobe Bryant shot just three times as he passed the ball again and again to his team. Teammates. He had made his point. The Lakers did need him to shoot Look to win. Look at the score, you guys. Look at the score. So it's always going to be the weirdest series ever as a Suns fan because we were so terrified of Kobe by this game seven point. And then the second half, Kobe just stopped shooting. And it was it was just apparent to, to all of us. It was like, dude, he just threw the whole season to, to prove a point to the media. Like he threw the whole season in the trash just to say, told you so. Like it was such a petty move. And wow. Yeah, it's it's crazy. I can't believe how far he came 
from this moment and to becoming an amazing leader. I thought there was not a chance in hell he'd develop into a good leader, but he did it. He proved me wrong. But really, this was more of a sign that his ego had gotten out of control. For sure. To Kobe, making a personal statement was more important than his teammates, the fans, his organization, a lot of people. In fact, this type of mindset from your lead star player seems like an unwinnable situation. So the question is, in a very short period of time, what would change in Kobe's mindset in order to get him to win two more titles? Especially because Kobe was getting very antsy as the 2006 season had ended with Shaq holding up an NBA championship trophy for the fourth yes, time. Sir, Looking at wait. the 2007 season, as they often do in life, things got worse before they got better. At least from a team perspective. Individually, the 2007 season was a masterful display of scoring from Kobe Bryant. To begin this year, Kobe would officially change his number to 24 from 8, publicly displaying a death of his old self. And instead, we now had the Black Mamba. Yep, 24 a Kobe. Number eight, Kobe, was always fun to watch. Number 24, Kobe, this is where it starts. This is this is the Kobe I, I ended up admiring. Um, cool killer. Yep. And that is what we saw in 2007 as Kobe took on the world and put on a one-man show. Kobe would score 65 points against the Blazers. Belong to the Blazers. Now Kobe for the tie. Got it! Did it again! Ties it at 98. They gave the three-pointer. Penetration on the fall away. Yes! Good, Good lord. Hard to believe. Are you Look kidding it. me? Unreal! Are you kidding me? 60 against the Memphis Grizzlies, 58 against Charlotte, 53 twice against Houston. When it was all said and done in the 2007 regular season, Kobe had 10 or more games with 50 or more points. 2007 Kobe was the true definition of scoring greatness, but his team was again not winning on the level that he wanted and his anger showed. Bryant in 2007 would make a few headlines due to hard or flagrant fouls, most notably when he hit many. Ginobili in the face and his anger could not be more apparent after a five game loss to the Suns in the first round of the playoffs. It was official. In this offseason, Kobe Bryant was demanding a trade. Yeah. Only the Lakers just refused to give in and they decided that because Kobe was under a long term contract, they were just not going to trade him and they were just going to make the roster better and instead of giving Kobe what he wanted in terms of a trade, they were going to give him what he wanted in terms of talent. Now Lamar Odom continued to be a walking double-double. Andrew Bynum had risen to become one of the best young centers in the league. Yeah, Los he Angeles had knee problems, though. He had uh, pff, uneven legs, in fact. Crazy thing. ...was still missing a true secondary star next to Kobe, but that would change on February 1st, 2008. As on that day, the Lakers were able to trade Kwame Brown, Javars Crittenton, Mark Gasol, Aaron McKee, a 2008 first-round pick, and a 2010 first-round pick for all-star Pau Gasol. Los Angeles was already 29-16 and 16 at this point in time. Gasol took them to the next mm -hmm. level. It is here, though, where I want to say we get the ultimate twist to this story. In terms of leadership, leadership and how he treated Smush Parker. Kobe never really learned his lesson or paid any real price for treating Parker this way. Reportedly, after an argument in practice oh. in 2015 with Jeremy Lin, 36-year-old Kobe did not speak to Lin for the rest of the season. <laughs> so obviously, Kobe did not change his ways. He still was willing to give teammates the silence. Okay, that's the biggest... fair. That's fair. I can't deny that. That did happen. That was very real. Yeah. And then even though I, I don't like Dwight Howard, he did do it to Dwight Howard, too. <laughs> so some things don't change. The difference between the 2006 and 2009 Lakers was, yes, a talent upgrade in Pau Gasol, but also players such as Pau Gasol were willing to respond to Kobe's extremely tough treatment. After his 2006 Ooh. MVP snub, the 2008 season was finally Kobe's, as with 28.3 points, 6.3 rebounds, and 5.4 assists per game on the top-seeded Lakers, Kobe won his first and only MVP of his career, and the Lakers had their sights on an NBA champion. 
championship. Now we need to remember, at this point in time, Kobe still had his own sights set on passing Michael Jordan in number of championships mm -hmm. won. In fact, after the 2008 season in 2009, Kobe finished second in the MVP voting. Then in 2010, he finished third. Kobe also finished third in 2007, which meant Kobe's overall resume as a player really was on the verge of Jordan-esque greatness. Obviously, Kobe is remembered as one of the best to ever play, but imagine if he had just put up a few more points and grabbed a few more rebounds and grabbed two more MVPs in the process. He was inches away. And if the Lakers had closed the 2008 NBA Finals, Kobe would have matched the amount of rings Michael Jordan had for his yep. career as well. Yep. Kobe would forever be haunted by the 2008 playoffs, but the Lakers did start out as one of the best playoff teams we have ever seen. Keeping in mind that the 2008 Western Conference was stacked to the point where all eight playoff teams were 50 win teams in the first Hold round up. again stacked to the point where yep suns were starting to fall at that point still good record but we weren't quite the same man i forgot how close that race is seven wins separating first from uh from eighth position damn rockets were still hanging around yeah oh dude did the jazz with darren williams Shout out to Darren Williams if you <laughs> think the guy was was elite. Where all eight playoff teams were 50 win teams. Oh, and uh, CP3, what's up? In the first round against the Denver Nuggets featuring Carmelo, Anthony, and Allen Iverson, an experiment that did not work. Kobe averaged 33.5 points per game as the Lakers swept through a team that did win 50 games. Then in the second round against the Jazz, things appeared to be going very well as Los Angeles won three of their first five games. However, in game six, the Lakers would enter the fourth quarter leading 86 to 70 before they completely collapsed. The Jazz would have a chance to make history after a massive comeback but luckily for the lakers the jazz would miss both of their three-point attempts to tie the game Kyle Corbett, gonna be for the tie real short williams can they get the stop he will yes that'll do it meaning the lakers had survived y'all y'all remember uh kirilenko ak-47 man no one talks about that dude that 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 dynamic duo was awesome out there Actually, it was a trio out there. Up next were the San Antonio Spurs, who had given the Lakers plenty of trouble before. This included the 2003 Western Conference semifinals, where the Spurs ended the Lakers' chance for a four-piece. So we were supposed to have a back-and-forth matchup, only at this point in time, Kobe and Gasol were just on another yeah. level. The Lakers won in five games, giving us a 2008 NBA Finals classic between the NBA's original rivalry, the Los Angeles Lakers versus the Boston Celtics. The Celtics had struggled through the Eastern Conference Finals in order to get to the Lakers. So again, we were supposed to have a back and forth matchup. The 2008 NBA Finals were as hyped up as they could possibly be. Only by game six, the Celtics had a chance to eliminate the Lakers and they did so in an absolute blow. The irony I always found is Derek Fisher comes back. They're contenders again. And I'm not going to put it all on him. Obviously, Pau Gasol was a huge part of this, but... No one gives Derek Fisher any love, dude. <laughs> he was there for all of Kobe Bryant's success. He was there for all of it. And so was Phil Jackson. Like, that trio made it happen. The reason for this and the dominant series by the Celtics in general was that suddenly for the Lakers, Kobe was a one-man show again. Shot clock at five. On the pull-up. Puts it up. Puts it in. I don't like the shots the Lakers are getting. Ball knocked away by Bryant. Here he goes down the other end. It's a very good post defender. Shot clock at three. Brian trying to draw a foul. Looks up a three. And again. Looks up at the shot clock. Here's Scott in. Kobe Bryant nails it. In the 2008 finals, Kobe averaged 25.7 points per game on 40% shooting, while no one else, not even Pau Gasol, averaged more than 15 points per game. Meanwhile, Boston's big three of Kevin Garnett, Paul Pierce, and Ray Allen were collectively unstoppable. Pierce to Garnett. Garnett inside. Back Damn. To what a make. From Kevin Garnett. And the Celtics go up by 20. On both ends of the floor, he has put this team on his back. Pierce, that's a three. Dang, it's the good. truth. Paul Pierce. The bottom hopefully will be healthy next year. Ray Allen. 
Sweetest jumper ever. He's got the best form I've ever seen. All three players averaged over 18 points per game, and it would take the Lakers another year of learning through loss before they won their first title after Shaq. After the Lakers lost to the Celtics in the 2008 this finals, is the anything Col is possible <laughs> moment. Kobe felt Pau Gasol's soft play was the reason why they lost. So in the Olympics against Spain and Pau, Kobe not only went out of his way to be extremely physical with mm -hmm. Pau, but also after beating Spain and after winning the 2008 gold medal kobe to begin the 2009 season put that gold medal on pau gasol's chair and asked pau are you going to lose a third championship or are you finally going to win pau gasol responded to this type of treatment smush parker did not ask for smush parker after the 2007 season smush would sign with the miami heat but his play fell off as he averaged just 4.8 points per game in miami and was waived by the team in march the clippers did pick up smush for the end of the season but let him go when the year was over and with that smush parker would never play in the nba again the thing is forever Kobe acted as if Smush had done something personally wrong to him just by existing. existing near him. In 2012, Kobe said Smush Parker shouldn't have been in the NBA, but the Lakers were too cheap to sign a real point. Damn. Card. Yikes. As for the ending Damn. of Kobe and Smush Parker's relationship, do we have a happy ending? It turns out the answer is yes and no. Because back in 2014, Smush Parker's pastor, who is a massive Kobe Bryant fan, asked Smush if he could ask Kobe for some gear. So Smush wrote Kobe a letter apologizing to Kobe, wow. trying to reconnect and mend things while asking if his pastor could get an autograph or some gear or something. And Kobe responded with the sign gear for the pastor, but he did not write back to Smush at all yet again Damn. choosing silence in his relationship with smush something <laughs> smush parker knew all too savage well. so thank you for watching i hope you enjoyed today's video if you are new to the channel make sure to subscribe and turn on post notifications that way you never <laughs> miss a video and also i really think you're going to like this video in the top left on caitlin clark and why she's having one of the most historic seasons ever or this video in the top right that youtube is recommending specifically for you dude that's funny right there that's a uh, white man can't jump <laughs> anyways good video good video dude he was ice cold to smush all the way to the end that's crazy i didn't know about that that whole thing with the pasture and the, the donated goods man i mean good on kobe for donating the the gear but man still wouldn't even say like what's up smush <laughs> you know like all good smush water under the bridge he hated him that's like real hatred I feel like there's got to be something else to it, but nothing was was public, so I guess we'll never know. But how could he hate him that much just for being there? I don't know. You could ask somebody about a football game and then have them hate you for the rest of your life. <laughs> Damn. Anyways, cool video by Mike Rizamba. Uh, link down below if you want to check out his channel. Um, we do, we do check in with, with this channel from time to time over here and, uh, it's good stuff. Um, what do I think about it? I just think it was savage. It was cold. Um, the video was cool. It covered a lot more than I thought it would. I thought it was going to focus more on the smush stuff, but it kind of showed really the majority of Kobe's career here. So cool video. Well done. Um, and, uh, not much else to say about it. Chime in down below with your comments. Um, shoot, it's crazy focusing on this era of Kobe for me because, like, I really didn't like Kobe at all back then. I gotta be real, I didn't up until the you know, the, the second stint with Phil Jackson. Then I started really noticing his change. And when Kobe switched jerseys to 24, he became a whole different dude. And he became a, a, a good leader, and the success is the proof of that. But yeah, watching him in that in that time period, um, post Shaq, post Phil, and he was just doing it on his own. I really didn't like Kobe back then, guys. But yeah, he eventually earned my respect tenfold. And by the time he retired, you know, I had him as my number two all time, still do. And um, seeing his uh, interviews and podcasts and stuff like that that he did 
after he retired from the game of basketball, that's when I really started going like, okay, this dude is special. You know, this guy, this guy's really cool. And I love the messaging that he was passing on. Uh, no excuses, be great. And, uh, you know, you want something, you work harder. You work harder than everybody else around you. And I loved it. Lit a fire in my butt. And I needed it too at that time. So anyways, enough blabbing here. Uh, like the video on the way out if you haven't done it yet. I'd appreciate it. Dislike it if you hated it. And uh, subscribe to the channel if you want more content like this. Peace out until the next one, all right? Thank you very much for watching.